This is a really cool video. Today we're talking with one of AMD's leading engineers on RDNA 3 to learn more in depth about how this architecture works. This man is Sam Nafziger. And if you're not sure why you should listen to him, he has a pretty good track record of proving exactly why you should. So I, I had to convince everybody in the company that chiplets were the way to go, you uh. know, back in 2016 when it was still completely unproven. Nafziger worked on AMD Zen architecture engineering previously, especially on power design, and is part of the engineering team that brought AMD out of the dark ages of bulldozer. Now he's been drafted to work on AMD's GPUs, but it wasn't as easy as just copy pasting Zen chiplet design over to GPU cores. We loved the chiplet concept. We knew that the wire counts were just too high in graphics to do to replay what we did on CPUs. In this educational interview, we were given the unique opportunity to talk with Sam Nafziger for 15 minutes about an architectural presentation that he gave to the press at AMD's conference previously. These opportunities only come around every few years. So if you want to learn more about RDNA 3 directly from someone who worked on it, and why it really uses chiplets and what that means for AMD's future, listen to this video closely. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Thermaltake Core P3 Pro open frame case. Back when we reviewed the original Core P3, we praised the case for its versatility as a standard desktop PC, a wall-mounted gaming machine, or a horizontal test bench for your testing projects. The P3 is back with updates, including an additional fan bracket, updated IO ports, and better main compartment layout to give cleaner kale management pathways. Learn more at the link in the description below. Just following the AMD Radeon 7000 series announcements, and I've got Sam Nafziger here, who joined actually for Zen 1 discussion. Did a long tour of duty on CPUs and power efficiency there. I drove the chiplet architecture for our uh, Ryzen and Epic lines. Right. Yeah. And then in late 2017, I moved into graphics and drove the performance per watt improvements uh, that we've been benefiting from there. And uh, most recently got to um, work on the chiplet architecture for our DNA 3. Yes. So it's been exciting. Which is really cool stuff. So uh, Sam did an excellent presentation here for the press. And I wanted to go back through a few points for everybody in the audience to benefit from. So the, the first question for you, just broadly speaking, obviously now on sort of uh, the chiplet design, the motivation for chiplets, I think that the obvious one is potentially cost, but there are other motivations as well. So uh, you were mentioning, for example, technology node improvements diminishing or having a different shrink rate for different types of technologies. Right. The, uh economically viable way to take advantage of these very expensive advanced process nodes is the fundamental um, benefit of chiplets, but there are many more in the long run. So I'll, I'll start with that cost one, but then I can touch on some others. Sure. But the, um, y yeah, th this is that scaling that you mentioned, and it's an interesting observation, and you know, our node improvements have been slowing down. They are still delivering good value, but they deliver that value in different ways for different components on a chip. So a system on a chip, you know, a big GPU or a CPU, it has analog interface components, it has a bunch of memory for caches, for buffering, all that stuff, and then it has logic that does the actual computation. The foundries have been able to find ways and do a pretty good job continuing to scale logic down mm -hmm. with each technology node. But the six transistor bit cells for memory have been falling off that curve because it, it's the it, we're just not able to shrink those components at the same rate as logic and analog IO has been off the curve for a long time yeah, it's nearly asymptoted yeah. at this yeah. point so yeah so you end up with you know as you're shrinking a, a die you end up with a larger and larger fraction of that die being consumed by these analog and IO pieces or by the memory pieces and the unfortunate reality is the cost per millimeter squared is the same no matter what you're building right. out of it, right? Right. So if you, you're essentially, you know, and these things are getting a lot more expensive as we go out there. So you look at that and you're like, wow, I hate spending this precious advanced node like five nanometer silicon on things that really don't need it because the analog IO stuff is just as good in six nanometer as it is in five. It's the logic that really needs the, the advanced node. Right, yeah, so this, you had another point in the, you were talking about as well with efficiency of how you utilize the different technologies, the different process nodes, for example, and right. trying to maximize the, I guess, the benefit or, um, I don't know, the technology occupancy of a given node. 
Yeah, well, that, that's what we, what we want to do is, you know, nodes are, especially for logic, the, like five nanometer, we get, we get a lot. We get, you know, substantial, like 15% uh, frequency boosts, uh, significant power reductions. For the memory components, well, well, first of all, if you look at the power breakdowns for a GPU, for instance, 85 to 90% of it is logic. Mm. The memory consumes a small fraction in total, and the rest of it are the interfaces. So the advanced node, if you apply it mostly to logic, you're getting 90% of the benefit. Right, the yeah. if, especially if you're, if you're trying to get that power benefit on, yeah. on whatever it is that consumes the most power that, on that's the chip. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So um, then, then to answer the rest of your question, like other motivations for chiplets, <clears throat> turns out there's we end up with a lot more flexibility. And, you know, so now that you got your SOC split up into multiple die, like we've been doing in Epic and Ryzen for many years, we can configure different counts of chiplets for different product segments, mm. for instance. Or, as we've done in the Ryzen line, you keep the same I.O. die and you just upgrade the CPU chiplet right. to the next node, the right. next Zen architecture uh, uh, version. So you, we end up with a lot more flexibility in product configs. So, yeah. Which I would imagine helps a lot with uh, anything as, as more sort of minor as a refresh versus a, an architectural advancement. You get, yeah, faster time to market for refreshes, upgrades, all sorts of things. Right. Yeah. Um, and on that topic, I guess, so hypothetical die cost, you had a, I thought, really good slide on. Because yeah. everybody in media has talked about how chiplets bring down costs, but not many of us have the perspective you all have yeah. for what does that mean. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so I, I had to convince everybody in the company that chiplets were the way to go you uh -huh. know, back in 2016 when it was still completely unproven. And so, yeah, I spent a lot of time scrutinizing costs, and, um, and this is one of those outcomes. And, um, yeah, so the gray bar here is our own internal yield models, which are pretty accurate, mm. of what the cost would be if we had to build this entire 16-core CPU. Monolithically. Yeah, monolithically with all the interfaces. And like I said, the, these, um, you know, the IO die would get a little bit smaller, going from 14 nanometer to 7 nanometer, but not that much, because most of that stuff, it's wires, it's big buffer IO buffers, and, and all of the associated analog components. So it ends up, and then it gets much bigger and yield gets a lot worse, mm. right? So you end up with a, a very expensive die. Like two, over 2x two <coughs> normalized yeah. cost, yeah. or 2.0 normalized cost. Yeah, because say, these, yeah. these little guys at um, 74, depending on which generation we're in, they're like 74 to 85 millimeter squared, mm. and you get over 1,000 of those on a wafer, they yield great. And so what you can do, you know, wafers have a fixed number of defects. So let's say you've got 50 defects across the wafer. Well, if you can only fit 100 of these big fat die on the wafer, you're mm. going to lose half of them to defects, right? right? But if we can fit 1,200 of these little die, you only lose 100 out of 1,200. Right? Right. So your yields are much, much higher. So that's why this is so much better. So am I reading this right where it looks like for eight cores, eight cores with a hypothetical monolithic seven nanometers to so the gray line, uh, it looks to be roughly equivalent to a 16-core chiplet approach. Yeah. Based on these models. So that's, that's right. That's kind of crazy. It'd like be, <laughs> you know, about half the performance. Right. right. And we'd have to do two complete um, tape-outs of a uh, leading-edge uh, SOC to get there. Yeah, plus, plus all the other... Uh, lim I guess the, the hidden benefit, too, is just the... Uh, ability to gain from the chiplet approach like you were just talking about on the next product launch because faster time to market, less complexity. And, and I should mention something that's perhaps not as obvious to those not steeped in the industry, right? Sure. So, whoops, the, um, the components in, actually, you know, this is kind of a good diagram. Maybe I'll sure. go there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the, the components in this IO die, these, um, uh, DDR interfaces and these uh, PCIe you know, Express, and then there's USB and Display Ports and all that stuff. That stuff's really hard design. It takes hundreds of engineers to develop these things, and those designs are very technology node specific. Mm. And and so it's a multi-year porting effort if you want to move to a, a new node, right? So you go back, you know, you go to these guys, yeah. <clears throat> seven nanometer CCD, 
if you were doing monolithic, not chiplet designs, you'd have to port all of this very complex logic into the next node along with the CPUs. And so you got a, a massive distributed design team. Whereas when you got chiplet approaches, you just design these little guys in the next node. Right. Leave all this, you can leave this the same. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and that, that would reduce, this probably I'm assuming plays into why Zen has been able to consistently launch on a fairly predictable schedule. It's made a big difference. Right. Yeah. So you end up, you, you can focus most of your engineering team on the stuff that adds the most value for the product. Right. Because just porting this stuff gin to gin, that's, that's overhead, right? Yeah. I mean, and engineers don't actually like to work on just technology ports. Right. They want to be doing <laughs> the new do stuff, new right? So yeah. they're more motivated and uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Uh, another point you had, so GPU versus CPU bandwidth requirements. This was talking about, for example, a, a CCD versus an yeah. MCD. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think one of your examples was, um, uh, the, the talking point was, why not take it as far as breaking out the monolithic silicon into even more just chiplets? Yeah. And yeah. the answer is not that easy, I guess. So. Yeah. The. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll stick with this sure. one. And I, I tried to illustrate it here. You know, so these are shader engines in a GPU, and that's pretty much a module. In fact, in RDNA 3, we made those. You know, they have the, in, the decoupled clocks that I talked about and right. stuff. So they're relatively independent units. But the, the bandwidth requirements are just so much higher with the GPU because we're distributing all of this work, the, you know, terabytes of, of data and um, um, textures and vertices and all this stuff. So um, way more, if, if you tried to route all that information across these CPU interfaces, it, it would be just gigantic. Couldn't, right. couldn't do it. Yeah, and so if, are you able to easily get that, uh, the sc scope shot up? I guess it was a microscope shot yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, let's go That was really the, cool. So the, what, what is this? If you can walk, <laughs> walk, us through, walk me through this yeah, again. Yeah. So, so this is one of those, um, so this is an MCD over here. So this is a little sliver, um, 50, more or less, 50 wires, um, of which we have uh, hundreds on all of those GCD to MCD interfaces. Mm. So this is what we call a filet if you will. Okay. <laughs> so we, the, these infinity um, links have a whole bunch of little filets that are grouped together to provide the infinity fabric interface that from a logical perspective, it looks just like a wire, but it goes in and it, and it actually gets um, the, uh, we quad pump the interface mm. and um, send the, the bits across here. So, you know, it'll come in here and then go route out and get, and the receiver will be over here. Right. Yeah. And I, I see the fan out routing mentioned as well, which was something you spent a good amount of time on in the presentation. Yeah. So fan out is a, is a packaging technology. And I have um, some other diagrams I didn't show of a, of a cross section, but mm. we have several layers of interconnect. And it's not silicon, it's built on this um, plastic like uh, overmold material. Mm. And so these are um, fine width space, much finer than you can get on an organic package, but not as fine as silicon. So it's a lot less expensive to manufacture than silicon, but we get um, very fine uh, line space and it provides a nice rigid foundation to mount those chiplets onto. And uh, is, is, it's been in use in um, smartphones and such for mm. a long time. Fan, it's, you can Google fan out technology. Sure. And what we've done is develop a much more, you know, we call it AMD high performance fan out because it's not for smartphones. It's right. performance oriented. So we had to add layers. We had to tighten up the line space and um, to support these bandwidths. Uh, I've got uh, two more for you. So. One of the slides was about, uh, you mentioned observing the periphery, uh, observing around the periphery, a large fraction of the die went to GDDR6. And uh, yeah. talking about um, the shrink factor for these components on the SOC not being very good, I think is what, yeah. what I wrote down. So. Yeah, that, that's, that's where we were. So we were, you know, we loved the chiplet concept, we knew that the wire counts were just too high in graphics to do, to replay what we did on CPUs. 
And so we were scratching our head, um, you know, how can we get significant benefit? Um, and we were aware of those scaling curves that right. I showed. And, and the observation was, you know, there actually is a pretty clean boundary between the infinity cache mm -hmm. um, and out. And we, we recognized that these things weren't, didn't need five nanometer and they were just fine for the product in N6. We were hardly spending any power, you know, and the, and the, the GDDR6 itself doesn't benefit at all from right. technology. So that's where we came up with the idea, you know, we already have these GDDR6 interfaces in N6 technology, like I talked about the cost of porting, right, mm -hmm. and all the engineers. And we already had that, and we could just split it off into its own little die. And um, I mean, you can see, see the results, right? So we were spending 520 millimeter squared here. We right. increased our, um, our compute unit uh, count by 20%. We added a bunch of new capability. But we, so this thing would, would be like over, you know, it'd be pushing 600, you know, 550 millimeter squared or something. Right. Um, but we shrank it down to 300. Cool. Well, I think uh, we got to wrap it up now, so <laughs> we're, we're getting right. the wave. But um, thank you very much for walking us. Yeah, through really pleased to, to be able to talk with you. Good questions. Thank you. And for anyone who wants to learn more about this, we'll have some coverage, hopefully, with uh, some more from Sam and Mike Mantor was part of the presentation as well, whom we've also interviewed. So check back for that. Subscribe for more. Thank you for watching. We'll see you all next time.